Good morning. If you will, take your Bibles and open them up with me to the book of the Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 8. We're going to be opening up the seventh seal. Now remember, the seals are seven strings holding the scroll together. So it won't open just to get a visual. Um, what is the scroll? What are the contents? The contents of the scroll are the title deed to earth. Who has dominion over the earth? And God, him, the Father says, who is worthy to open up the scroll? Nobody stepped forward. Satan illegitimately has dominion of the earth. Who legitimately has dominion of the earth? Jesus Christ alone. Described as the Lion of Judah, the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. This is Jesus Christ alone. And now in chapter 6, the seals have been uh, taken off one by one. Six of them. We have... Uh, the seal of the white horse, the seal of the black horse, the seal of the pale horse, um, uh, the red horse also in there, sometimes called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But really, don't get caught up in the visual picture so much. Is trying to understand the content, the information that is trying to be disseminated. John is trying to let us know that Jesus is going to take back legitimate control, dominion of the earth. How do we know that this starts happening? Well, there's going to be uh, an antichrist come on the scene. A uh, The white horse brings a man of conquest. He's going to mimic Jesus Christ. He's going to bring in, there's going to be all kinds of war, all kinds of conflict. There's going to be, you're not going to be able to get basic supplies to live. Uh, it's going to be unprecedented amount of death. Um, the death toll will be huge. Uh, some of those will be martyrs, and we, we know from verse 9 of chapter 6 that the martyrs that the Antichrist is going to be killing is going to be hollering out, how long are you going to allow this to go on? And God says, just a little while longer. And then we see um, the sixth seal being broken and we see man all kinds of natural phenomena happening cosmic disruption going on and then in chapter 7 we had kind of a pause where uh, the 144,000 our evangelists our Jews are shown to be going out throughout all the earth and a great multitude of people are going to be getting saved during this time so now we, we get back to chapter 8, which is going to be the seventh seal, the final seal being taken off the scroll. Once this seal is taken off, the scroll can be opened. So I want you to see that there's three sets of judgments in the book of the Revelation. There are the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. Now, all that being said, it is just kind of like a curtain being pulled back of Jesus Christ coming and ruling and reigning on the earth. So take away all the apocalyptic language, the imagery, the pictures that are drawn in your head, and just try to understand that God is bringing his plan to uh, the end. He is going to be ruling and reigning for a thousand years. This seven-year period called the Great Tribulation is going to begin with the Antichrist coming on the scene. With Antichrist is going to come all these natural disasters. It's going to come, uh, the death toll is going to rise because of him. From this, even uh, his trying to wipe out the Jews, even though that, through that, countless multitude is going, are going to be saved during this time. So the seal judgments move right into the trumpet judgments. And then what is the seventh seal? 
The seventh seal equals the seven trumpets. What is the seventh trumpet would be the bowl judgments. And so without getting too caught up in it, it's just an extension, a progression of God's judgment being carried out. So in this book, it's easy to kind of get off track in the pictures and trying to figure out what it looks like rather than trying to understand what actually is going on. So the trumpet judgments, if you haven't already read uh, chapter 8, we're going to go through four of them. There'll be more coming in chapter 9. If you can picture a trumpet being sounded to signal war, war its own, uh, like a bugle calling people uh, into action, this is what is happening here. And we're going to see all kinds of, if you thought the, the seal judgments were bad, it's going to get worse with the trumpet judgments. And so if you haven't already read chapter 8, read it now. We're going to pray and we're going to dive into it. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to understand, at least in some degree, and Father, may we come to the book of the Revelation not wanting to have all of our questions answered. But Father, to just get to know you and to learn to trust you. Father, if we can trust you, that 69 weeks that were prophesied in Daniel have already taken place exactly like you said. Father, help us to know that we can trust you for the 70th week also. So, Father, as we look more in depth at this great tribulation, this 70th week of Daniel, may we understand that, Father, what you say will happen, will happen. And, Father, on your timetable, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth, just like it is carried out in heaven. And, Father, may we be a part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So chapter 8 breaks down four different trumpet blasts. And these trumpet blasts are calling into action the angels from chapter 7 who were told to stand back and wait. Don't it look back at chapter 7, uh, verse 3. It says, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until... Okay, so they've been given authority to really start wreaking havoc on the earth. And so the only thing holding it ba them back is the, the, the people that God wants to save. So now we're starting to see this come into action. It says, verse, chapter 8, verse 1, When the Lamb broke the seventh seal. So remember, the scroll had seven strings. This is the last one. Boom. It says, there was silence in heaven for a half an hour. Now, you may not think a half hour is a long time, but if right during this video, if I said, wait, now, you would think something's wrong with your computer or your TV and you'd be scurrying around, but all I was doing was giving a pause. Now that was only five seconds. Seemed like a long time, didn't it? If you think about everything that we've pictured in heaven, all the angels and all the elders and all of the four living creatures, all bringing praise and glory to God, it has to be a marvelous scene that all of a sudden, whoo, everything is hushed. Everything is quiet for the span of a half hour. And I think it's very stark. What's happening? This kind of moment of silence before judgment falls. This is how serious, how somber this is. Uh, this seventh seal being loosed. It says, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now, I don't want to go into everything about these seven angels, but the tradition of Hebrew history says that around God's throne, there are seven angels there. Now, I don't know. All I know is that it says here, 
there's seven angels there before God who's on the throne. And they stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Remember, John is just seeing things in his vision and he's telling us about it. It says, another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer. And much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, verse 3. We've got a picture of saints praying. Now, the connection between incense and prayer is one that goes all the way back to the tabernacle and the altar of incense in the holy place. So, the idea is that the incense going up to God and bringing a sweet smell to him represents our prayers. And when we seek God and when we trust God and when we commune with God, it's a sweet smell to him. Now, this prayer, it, it says, uh, verse 4, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up, before God, out of the angel's hands. Now, what are these prayers that he's talking about? The only thing that I have in context is, if you go back to chapter 6, look at verse 11. It says, in, we'll look at verse 10, and they cried out, the martyrs did. And let's read verse 9 too, about the fifth seal. When the lamb broke the fifth seal... I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained even at great cost to themselves. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So what are they praying? They're praying, God, You've told us to trust our lives to you. How long are you going to allow this evil to wipe out your children? And listen to God's response. And there was given to each of them a white robe. And they were told, now the same white robe from chapter 7, verse 13, about this great multitude that got saved during the tribulation. Many of them, though, will be killed. It says, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and the brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So chapter 7 goes into what that all looks like. Big picture. Okay, These people, lots of them are getting murdered during the tribulations because they're, they're stand for Jesus Christ. So in chapter 8 now, we have these prayers going to be answered. No longer are they to rest and wait, but now God's judgment is going to be poured out. Look at verse 5 of chapter 8. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. So the censer represents, hey, the prayers of the saints, and now they're getting answered. And he throws it down uh, to the earth, avenging the murderous acts of the Antichrist and his regime. And it says in verse 6, And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. This is getting right down to it. Now what's about to happen is going to be so out of ordinary, so beyond the pale, that people are going to have to attribute what's going on to God. Uh, sometimes people say, well, that's, you know, nature. Just This is going to be so bad that people are going to have to recognize that this is the wrath of God being poured out. Let's dive into it. Verse 7, the first trumpet sounded. And all of these are dealing with kind of a natural phenomena happening. Just like some of the seals were, it's going to get worse. Look what it says. There was hail and fire mixed with blood. 
and they were thrown to the earth. Now, I don't know if it was uh, truly hail, truly fire mixed with it, what that looks like with blood. So we've got hail, fire, and blood all mixed up together. Remember, John is seeing things and he's just telling us about them. What we do know is whatever that is, whatever John saw, what is it doing to the earth? Remember, these angels were given authority in chapter 7 to harm the earth, the sea, and the trees. So look what it says. A third of the earth was burned up. You think the wildfires that are going on in the west right now are bad. When you think of a third of everything on the earth being burned up, not only that, a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Now, this is going to affect lots. I mean, where do we get oxygen from? We get it from the, I mean, you hear all this stuff about the rainforest and stuff like that. This is going to shift the whole ecology of the world. This is the first trumpet, the plague on vegetation. Let's move on. Remember, this is talking about calling judgment. This isn't even the judgment. This is just the earth groaning as uh, Romans 8 talks about, waiting for the fulfillment. We have the martyrs calling for the fulfillment. We have the earth groaning, and now it's happening. The second angel, verse 8, sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. It doesn't say it was a great mountain. It says it was like a great mountain. Maybe it was an asteroid or a meteor, some massive piece of rock slamming into the oceans. This is a plague on the sea or the oceans. And look what it says. A third of the ocean became blood. So when we're talking ocean here, we're talking about salt water. So a third of the salt water became blood and a third of the creatures which were in the ocean and had life, guess what happened to them? They died. And the third of all the ships that are on the ocean were destroyed. Now, that's massive scale here. Um, if a third of everything in the ocean died, well, I think that would let you know where the blood would come from. What a stench. What a mess this would be. And it would throw everything into a tizzy. So we've got the first plague the first trumpet is against the vegetation. Second, against the oceans. The third, verse 10, a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on the third of the rivers and the springs. This is fresh water. So we've got the plague against the ocean, salt water, and now against the drinking water, the fresh water. And it says, the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the thing, and a third of the waters became wormwood. It's just another word for bitter, meaning poisonous. Could not drink them any longer. And many men died from drinking the water because they were made bitter or unclean. They were contaminated. Now, you have to have water. So think about a third of all the water that you can drink in the world. Contaminated. What is this that falls? What is this wormwood star? Some people think that it's a comet. It doesn't really matter what it is. Remember, John is seeing a vision and he's starting, he's trying to describe what he sees. But if you take all the, the visual, the picture language away, just start to understand that as God starts to carry out and pour out his wrath on the rebellious on earth, it's going to be a lot of natural disasters happening. Things that no one can explain. Now we hear warnings all the time that, hey, there was a meteor uh, that came close to Earth. I mean, like five light years away or something. 
Well, what would happen if one hit? Now you know. Let's go. Let's keep going uh, to the fourth angel sounded. And it says, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third uh, of the stars were struck down. Okay, so it, it doesn't mean that they, they fell to earth. The, the moon does not fall to the earth. What it's saying is the light that they give didn't dim. Look what it says. So that a third of them would be darkened and the day would not shine for a third of it. So for one third of the day, so we've got 24 hours a day. So eight, eight, eight. Three times eight is 24. So for eight hours longer than normal. Um, if you can even imagine, because the moon and the stars light at night. So for, for eight hours a day, total darkness. I don't know if you've ever seen what total darkness looks like. I think the closest I've ever come to it is going into a, a cavern. And when you get down underground, they shut off the lights. And there's a difference between total darkness. Here, uh, the fourth trumpet is going to be total darkness for at least eight hours a day. Um, in Matthew 24, verse 29, I want to read this to you. Matthew 24, verse 29. The Bible says this. Um, and he's talking about perilous times and the glorious return. But verse 4, 29 says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, then all the tribes of earth will mourn and they will see the sun coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds or the four corners from the ends of the sky uh, to the other. And they're going to walk right into the thousand year reign. We see it happening as described as the last or the fourth trumpet. So we've got the plague against the vegetation. We've got the plague against the oceans. We've got a plague against all the fresh water. And now we've got a plague of darkness on the earth. Listen to what verse 13 says. Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven. Now, whether, I don't know whether this is an eagle. Some people say that the word eagle and angel kind of um, are easy to confuse. The text says eagle. So whatever he's seeing, he's seeing and he's describing. But if this is an angel is what I tend to believe. This angel is saying something with a loud voice. Look what he's saying. Woe, woe, woe. Remember, woe is just the word Jesus used it several times in the Gospels to talk about people who refuse to confess and repent of their sin. And it was basically the idea of mourning for somebody's death while they were still alive, meaning there's no hope for you. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. Because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So as bad as it is, with a third of the vegetation gone, burn up. With a third of the oceans spoiled. With a third of the drinking water not even being able to be drunk. With uh, a third of the day being totally dark. He said that's nothing compared to what the last three trumpet blasts are going to be. Um, a third of the earth's population will be killed, will die in the next three trumpets. These four trumpets are attacks on food, water, and anything bringing comfort. All that, that, uh, that consists in normal life. Think about it. 
Can you have normal life without any grass or trees? No, you can't even breathe. What would it be like without the ocean? What would it be like without drinking water? What would it be like in total darkness? What's God doing? Even during this time, God is giving, the, the wrath is not being poured out yet. Remember, the wrath is not coming to the bold judgments. God is trying to humble mankind. All of these natural disasters are happening. Will they humble people? Or do they just bring people to the point of despair? I think that even as we see from the seal judgments to the trumpet judgments and ultimately the final bold judgments happening, God is extending mercy over and over and over again with hope that mankind would humble themselves and come to Messiah. Now, I don't know where you're at in this process. Maybe God is allowing a lot of things to happen in your life that you can't control. And I think ultimately when we're confronted with this, our first general response is anger. Things aren't going the way that I want them to go. But ultimately, God is trying to show us that he is the king. He is sovereign. He is omniscient, all-knowing. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. He's God. I'm not. I'm born into this world thinking that, hey, I know I can take care of me when clearly the answer to that is that I cannot. And so I ask you this question. It's easy as we go through all of this to start, you know, having a certain amount of intellectual uh, Inquis inquisition, where we, we start to think, oh, I'm learning all this good stuff, but let's take a moment and apply what's God trying to show us. He's the ruler of this earth. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. I am just his creation. And the answer in the, to the question is, will I humbly submit to the ruler, to the king? Have I? Am I? Will I? At any point, if I say I'm a Christian, have I said, no, I ain't doing that? Evaluate what God's doing in your life. Instead of fighting him about what he's allowing to go on in our lives, can we stop and say, God, I don't know what you're trying to show me, but the one thing that always seems to be happening is you're trying to humble me. You're trying to show me what I truly deserve, but what you and your grace and mercy are trying to extend to me. I pray that as we start going and we continue to go through this book, that God will become bigger in your eyes. He will become more magnificent and that you will become smaller in your own eyes. If you haven't humbled yourself before the Lord, I pray that today would be the start of that. Today is the day of realizing I was born in slavery. I was born enslaved to a wicked master who wants to destroy me. I didn't even have any choice in that. But that God, who's rich in grace and rich in mercy, has extended to me the opportunity to be set free from this slavery that I was forced into, being under this terrible master, and he's offering me a free gift, saying, hey, you can be part of my kingdom. You can be my slave, but you're going to have to choose it. I have provided this for you. Here it is. All you have to do is recognize that you're enslaved to sin and a bad master. You have to realize the work that I've done so that you can be made right. And then 
You have to unconditionally surrender your life. Your life will no longer be yours, but it was never yours. You were a slave to sin. Now you're going to be a slave to me. The difference between being a slave to Christ is that he's a good master. He doesn't just keep you to be his slave. He makes you his son, he shares the inheritance. He wants to make us his ambassadors, to use us for his glory, to further his kingdom. And then as we see all these events start to happen, we can say, look up. Our hope is coming true. As you read this, if you start building a, a sense of concern and worry, it's either because you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, or you have, but you've never gotten involved in the ministry of reconciliation. So I would ask you, I would beg you, examine where you're at in the process, and what God shows you, willingly agree with. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit and what he tells you to do. Do it. Father, we love you. We thank you for your plan. And Father, we look forward to the day when our faith will be made sight. Even so come, Lord Jesus.